Um, grand, right, so we've just started recording. So hello everyone, welcome. My name is Matt Williams. I am the Access Fellow of Jesus College at the University of Oxford. Uh, Jesus College is one of the 30 undergraduate colleges at Oxford University. It's uh, often known as the Welsh College because it was founded by a Welshman uh, in accordance with the wishes of the Queen of England, Queen Elizabeth I, back in 1571. That's when William Shakespeare was just a seven-year-old boy. Uh, we're about to celebrate our 450th uh, birthday next year, so looking forward to that. Um, I teach politics at Oxford, but I'm also what's known as an Access Fellow, meaning that I'm responsible for encouraging people, especially those who are currently underrepresented at Oxford, to make strong applications. That's why we've set up this webinar and it's why we've set up this essay writing competition because we want to share some of our love of essay writing and some of the skills that we've developed in Oxford over 900 years. So that's the, the basic point of these sessions and I'm thrilled to see so many of you here. What I'm going to do is I'm going to share my screen so that you can see some slides and I'm going to use these slides as the basis for our discussion. But as mentioned, you must feel free at any moment to submit questions or comments and I'll keep an eye out for anything you might wish to say. And there'll be an opportunity at the end for some questions as well. Okay, anyway, let's, uh, let's dive in. Uh, so as I mentioned, I'm Matt and here's my email address. Should you wish to contact me after this session, you're most welcome to do so. Uh, it can be on anything such as essay writing or Oxford or universities or politics or whatever you like. Um, so the, the official title of this webinar is um, How Essays Save the World Several Times Over, History of the Craft and How to Write Better Essays and Save the World Yourself. Now this is a slightly sort of hyperbolic title, it's quite sort of in your face and the point of that is that I want people to fall in love with essays because essays have almost certainly affected the way you live, whether you're conscious of it or not. And I get the impression that lots of people are a little bit jaded by essay writing. They write a lot of essays for school and they start to think of them as a bit of a chore and they, they fall out of love with them. But these are incredibly powerful things, essays, and we ought to respect them and we ought to try and find a way to enjoy writing them because you have the capacity to change the world yourself. And that's ultimately what we do at university is we give people skills to solve just terribly intractable problems. Uh, so currently in Oxford, uh, Professor Sarah Gilbert is trying to come up with a vaccine for coronavirus. And she is a perhaps particularly prominent example of what we try and develop in our students, which is that ability to take a problem that lots of people have struggled with and come up with a solution to it. And the essay is the mechanism by which we convince other people that we have that solution. It's a, it's a bit of a sales tactic. It's a way of telling people we've solved this, you should agree with us. So it's a genuinely sort of empowering and wonderful thing. And I'd like everyone to fall a bit more in love with essays. So where do essays come from? What is the history of the essay? There's all sorts of dispute about this. In fact, there are many essays written about essays, as you can predict. Um, what is typically agreed, however, is that the first major collection of essays comes from a, a man called Michel de Montaigne. He was a Frenchman and he was writing in the 16th century. He's considered to be one of the architects of what became known as the Enlightenment, this period of scientific and humanistic development in, in societies around the world, and in particular uh, in parts of Europe, um, towards developing ideas and problem solving and applying reason and evidence to fix the various issues that we've faced around us. What Montaigne did that was so unusual was that he didn't just regurgitate what other people had told him to think, but he came up with his own ideas. And that's where the word essay comes from. It's a derivative of a French verb meaning to try or to attempt. And that is one of the essences of an essay is that it's your attempt, it's your you're you trying to come up with a solution to a problem that is not easy to solve. Indeed, many of the, the essays we try and write are on problems that can never be solved fully. They will always be open to debate. But you're trying, you're attempting, and that's the point of an essay. You, the writer, are giving us some sort of plausible solution to the problem. What quite a lot of people think essays are for is a way of just showing off how much stuff you know and how many other people's ideas you can cram into a particular piece of writing. But ultimately, it's about you. It's a, quite a selfish act. It's about you explaining what you think is going on. And it is put so perfectly by Montaigne. He was 
in intellectual terms, a very selfish man in the sense that he just always told everyone what he thought. And his essays are really wonderful and very readable as well. If you go on Project Gutenberg, which is a website, which is gutenberg.org, you can read the entire uh, of his essays in English and they're absolutely wonderful. They, they changed the world themselves in part because they absolutely transformed the way that William Shakespeare thought about things and it, and it yeah, informed his way of writing. They also affected other amazingly important scientists and humanists during the uh, early enlightenment, people like Francis Bacon, uh, Christopher Wren, Isaac Newton, uh, Robert Hooke. So this sort of approach to using logic, reason and evidence to make your case was utterly transformative and ended the era of authority where academics basically did what they were told and created this era of liberalism where academics just said what they thought. Uh, and that's kind of where we still are now. Um, anyway, here's, a, here's an excerpt from one of his uh, essays um, on prognostications. There yet remain amongst us some practices of divination from the stars, from spirits, uh, from the shapes and complexions of men, from dreams and the like, a notable example of the wild curiosity of our nature to grasp at and anticipate future things as if we had not enough to do to digest the present. I mean, that's a great point, right? So we have this sort of bizarre, almost pathological curiosity about what's going on around us, even though just staying alive and constantly doing our day-to-day -day tasks is pretty engrossing for, for many of us. I, I think this speaks quite a lot to what's going on right now with lockdown insofar as we're, as a species, bizarrely curious about our place in the universe and what we should be doing and who we are and all these sort of huge questions, when actually just even getting through most days can be pretty tiring and difficult. So it's a really excellent uh, set of work, so I highly recommend you have a look at it. Anyway, uh, so that's, he's, if you like, the father of essay writing, Montaigne. So if you really do hate writing essays for school, then you should blame him. But hopefully you won't hate essay writing by the end of this. So let's just rattle through some frequently asked questions about essays that I, that I encounter a lot, uh, or perhaps more accurately, awkward questions that I get awkward, asked a lot, because awkward questions are much more funny and interesting. And the reason I'm asked quite a lot of questions about essays is because I'm a tutor in Oxford. I've been teaching there for over a decade, and I've read literally thousands of essays. Now, important point, I still don't know how to write excellent essays. I'm st it's one of those crafts like woodworking or music where you will never be fully satisfied with your abilities. You'll, you can always be better. Um, I'm writing a book at the moment and no doubt that's going to be sort of criticised quite heavily by, by readers and that's okay. So don't worry about sort of obtaining perfection because that's not likely to happen. But anyway, if you like, the reason why I'm offering you these thoughts on what's often asked of me is because I've got quite a lot of experience of reading lots of essays. So first of all, really important, awkward question. What is the point? Why do we force children around the world to learn a skill, essay writing, that you never really use in the real world? So when you go out into work uh, uh, into the labor market, it's not very likely that your boss will say, I really want you to write me an essay on the wives of Henry VIII, because um, it's not very likely to make them much money if you do uh, if you do that. So what is the point in learning how to write essays? Well, because it is, a, it is a fundamentally useful skill of managing doubt. Doubt is all around us. There's so much stuff that we're actually not very sure about in our lives. And people that are good at essay writing are the sort of people that are good at solving those uncertainties, of coming up with some workable solution around something that we're not sure about. So take, for example, if you're, in a, if you're working in a business and you want to think, well, the problem here, the doubt is, how do we make this business bigger and stronger? Then you would be the sort of person that could come up with a report, come up with some innovations to help grow that business. If you become a lawyer, then the doubt is, how can I secure the best outcome for my client? If you're a doctor, the doubt could be, who should we give this critical intervention to, given that we've only got, let's say, one... Uh, uh, one organ and there's multiple patients that need it. There's always uncertainty and doubt in our lives and the essay skills you up to be able to manage that doubt in a way that other people will find persuasive. So that's why we teach you this skill, not because writing essays is something you're likely to do much as an adult, but because the skills you develop in writing essays will be extremely marketable and useful. 
And those people that can manage doubt effectively become the most powerful people in the world. So that's why we teach you how to write essays. We're not sadists, we're not psychopaths that like torturing young people into doing something that they find inherently unpleasant. We're doing it because it's absolutely in your best interest. It will make you more powerful. And who doesn't want to be more powerful? Um, why is writing an essay so difficult is another question I'm commonly, co commonly confronted with. Um, there's lots of potential answers to this, but I think one of the primary reasons why essay writing is difficult is because it's so personal. It is something where you are being asked what you think about a particular problem. And therefore, you're, you're almost bearing your soul. And that can be quite difficult. It's quite difficult to know what you think. Now, a point I'm going to make later in the, uh, in the session is that you don't necessarily need to be speaking honestly in an essay. The key thing is showing off your skill of persuasion, but it doesn't necessarily mean that you have to believe what you're saying. So I think one of the core difficulties of essay writing can be reduced if you don't worry so much about what you believe all the time, but what you can persuade someone of. Anyway, uh, what's the best and what's the worst essay you've ever read? Well, I've been privileged to read loads of absolutely fantastic essays. Most of the essays I read are brilliant. And the best ones are the ones that really change my outlook on the world. They, they take a, a problem that I've been wondering about myself and they give me an, an, a wholly fresh insight on it. They, they give me some ideas that I had never dreamt of putting together. So for example, we, when we ran this essay competition last year, uh, a young lady, year eight student, wrote an essay about why footballers are paid more than nurses. And she challenged the the, the mindset that, in, that footballers are in fact paid more than nurses because she said that's a category error. What you're talking about is why are male premiership football players paid more than nurses? But if you look at footballers more carefully, it actually includes people that are in much less secure employment, uh, many of whom are women who are underpaid relative to men. And she just made this ter terrific argument that actually footballers aren't paid more than nurses and it's just a mistake led by our perception of what a footballer is. It was brilliant and I'd never thought of that and it's changed my perspective ever since and it was, it was wonderful. And so she won the essay competition. Um, the worst essays, I mean, I'm not, I'm not really that critical of essays very often. So I don't read many essays that I think are really, really bad. But I suppose the ones that are most disappointing are the ones where someone's made zero effort. So if, for example, they've just copied and pasted something that someone else has said, that just seems so lazy. Uh, and disappointing that someone wouldn't even want to try, wouldn't even want to try and express themselves is just massively disappointing. But like I say, that's very rare. I don't read many bad essays at all. Um, what's the ultimate objective? Um, the ultimate objective is to enhance your skills, to make yourself a superhero, to make yourself more powerful, to, to take the doubt in the world and the universe around us and to take control of it yourself. That's the ultimate objective. And writing good essays will just give you so many skills. And it doesn't matter whether your ambitions are to become a doctor or an astrophysicist or a mathematician or uh, a, a, an English teacher or whatever, in all of those professions, the capacity to argue effectively is essential. Um, how can I get the best possible marks? It's a difficult question, and we're gonna be going through some of the top tips later in this session. But fundamentally, you're trying to convince someone that you've got the right solution to the case. So maybe you should try thinking about writing an essay as a being a bit like a lawyer in a courtroom. You've got a client and your client is desperately looking to you to try and stop them from going to prison. So you have to try and convince the judge and the jury that your client is innocent of whatever they've been accused of. And you're doing a similar thing in an essay. You've got a client, you've got a particular argument and you're trying to fight for them. You're trying to make sure that that argument wins the day. And if you do that in a way that is easy for your readers to understand, because it's nice and clearly structured and it's persuasive and it's thoughtful, then you'll probably get some excellent marks, okay? But I'm gonna go through more specific examples of how you can achieve that uh, later in this session. Okay, um, so where should we start? Uh, the photo here is um, a collection of essays written by Harold Wilson. Harold Wilson was Prime Minister of Britain in the 1960s and the 1970s. And he was an undergraduate student at Jesus College. And so we've got all of his essays because in those days, in the 1930s, when he was a student in Oxford, people used to write all of their essays in exercise books like this. 
and we've got all of his exercise books in our archives. So I've read many of Harold Wilson's essays and marked them as if they were modern essays. And they're pretty good, but you, what you see here is a former prime minister's um, essays when he was a student of uh, philosophy, politics, and economics in the 1930s. Anyway, where should you start with your essay writing? Um, well, first of all, you need to think about what question you want to select and how you should select the best questions to show off your abilities. Uh, it's not an easy thing to do to select questions. There's quite a lot of gut instinct involved as well. And so far as this, there's certain things that you'll find automatically appealing because you're more interested in them or you're more emotionally connected to them, or there could be lots of reasons. You might just be more knowledgeable about a certain subject. But do try and pick a question that will best show off your skills. That's ultimately what you're doing. You're trying to show off your ability to solve a problem and to argue a case. Remember that, what I was saying about you being a bit like a lawyer in court? You need to try and picture that and think of a question that can best show off your ability to argue. And so it might not be actually something that you're most knowledgeable about, but it might be something that you think you can show off your ability to, to solve problems, okay? So what I've shown you here is a couple of examples of questions from a, a University of Oxford website called Oxplore, O-X-P-L-O-R-E.org. And Oxplore uh, has some fantastic questions, very sort of mind stretching questions and lots and lots of information that can help you try and come up with a solution to those questions. But what the questions all have in common is that they're not, they're not really easily resolvable. They're going to be contestable until the end of time. And that's exactly the sort of problems that we deal with in essay writing. They're just intractable problems. Okay, so for example, is knowledge dangerous? There's no right answer to that. That could be could go anyway. Uh, do humans need religion and uh, are humans ruining the earth? These are all sort of ultimately contestable questions, okay, and that's the beauty of them and that's why coming up with good essays will make you very powerful. Okay, so select a question that you think can show off your skills and then you need to think about how you can go into researching this. So a good way to do your research is to lead in with a hypothesis, with a, with a thought in mind. In other words, let's say you're taking the question, is knowledge dangerous? Don't start reading until you've had a thought, uh, until you've thought about what your answer might be. So you should start reading already with the idea that knowledge is dangerous, or it isn't dangerous, or it is dangerous, but only to an extent. The reason that you start reading with a theory in your head is because then it makes your reading much more targeted and focused, and it also makes you more critical. Because if someone tries to say something that goes against your theory, you're going to be trying to question why they would say that and whether or not you think they're valid. The problem if you go into reading without any argument in mind is that you'll just be buffeted by what everyone else has to say and it'll just make you more and more confused. It's not to say that you should be sticking doggedly to your theory. If someone comes up with something that you read that is really mind-blowing and convincing, then for goodness sake, adapt your theory or even abandon it completely but at least you've got a slightly more focused approach to your research and reading if you've got a theory in mind before you touch any of the books, okay? So start with a theory, start with a question, that will focus your research and your reading, but be open-minded, don't just uh, sort of stick to your guns. Um, don't overread. Reading in many ways is the easy part of essay writing because you can always read something else, but when you actually need to come down to writing, that's the bit that can be quite difficult. So don't sort of just keep reading because then you'll just run out of time. And mix up your sources. These days you don't need to just read in order to obtain fantastic information. As I mentioned, I'm half blind and so doing lots of reading is, is very, very tiring for me. So I mix it up, I, I listen to podcasts, I download lectures from YouTube, uh, I use what's called iTunes University or iTunes U, which is available through the Apple Store. Um, there are lots of sources these days which can be used that don't entail just reading. So it's a good idea to mix up your sources so that you don't become too fatigued by any one particular technique. Okay, uh, here's a picture of Oxford. Sadly, we can't visit it because of the lockdown, but hopefully we'll go there soon. So now I'm gonna go through some of my tips as to how to write a killer essay. And bear in mind, as I said earlier, I still am trying to work it out myself. So I'm not necessarily an expert, but I have read a lot of essays. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go through these three questions that I outlined earlier and just explain how you can write a particularly strong and convincing essay to any of these three. So the questions were, are humans ruining the earth? Is knowledge dangerous? And do humans need uh, religion? So first of all, you need to start 
well in an essay. Now, what on earth does that mean? Well, ultimately, the point of the essay is for you to try, remember, it comes from a French word to try, try and resolve this puzzle. So a good introduction provides an answer. You need to answer the question, the whole question, and nothing but the question. Imagine in this instance that you're a politician and you've been asked a question on the news. It's really frustrating if the politician ducks and weaves and doesn't really get to grips with the question. So what you want to do is to avoid that completely. Your essay should start with a really resolute and clear response to the question. So if someone's asked you, are humans ruining the earth? Your opening line could be something like, yes, humans are ruining the earth. It really is as straightforward as that, absolutely clear and resolute. Or no, humans are not ruining the earth. Or they are ruining the earth, but to a particular extent. In other words, just respond directly to the question. And perhaps the best way of doing that in your introductory paragraph is to just use the question wording itself. So you just repurpose the, the question in order to frame your answer. Is knowledge dangerous? Knowledge is dangerous, could be your opening line. Nice, easy. I know it doesn't sound terribly sophisticated, but it is absolutely clear. And it's very easy, therefore, for your readers to take it on board. And the sophistication can come later in the essay. When it comes to an introduction, you're just trying to provide everyone with an on-ramp onto your, onto your motorway, if you like. You're trying to help everyone just get up to speed with what you're trying to say. And clarity is very much the best way forward, okay? So nice and clear, answer the question. Make sure you answer the whole question and make sure you answer nothing but the question. Another very common problem with, with essay writing is that people start to veer off the point. They might start answering a question that they rather been asked, just as the politician might do on television, or they just lose focus and discipline and they start going off, off the point. Either approach means you're not answering the question and that means you're not contributing to the marks. When examiners write essay questions, they do so very carefully and deliberately. And if someone starts to just move off the point, they're not contributing to their own marks. So anything, any sentence in an essay of yours that doesn't contribute to answering the question is not contributing to the marks and you should just get rid of it, okay? You need to be quite sort of strict with yourself. Is this sentence I'm writing here answering the question? If yes, keep it in. If no, get rid of it, okay? So nice strong start, resolute, be clear, use the question wording would be my advice. Next up, this is my son, Teddy, in our dining room at uh, Jesus College at Christmas time. Why am I showing you a picture of him? Well, because I think it's a good idea when you're trying to analyze the question you're confronted with to think a bit more like a toddler. In other words, be really perceptive and curious and ask lots and lots of questions. Why, 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 why is your most powerful question. And it's something that Teddy asks me all the time about everything. Why is the sky blue? Why am I not allowed to spit on the floor? Why can't I eat chocolate for breakfast? You know, the sort of questions that toddlers ask. And they're great questions, right? Um, so try and unleash your inner toddler because that, that inner, inner child will make you stronger, not weaker, because that inner child is endlessly curious and perceptive and doesn't take anything for granted. If I give Teddy something that he's not familiar with, he just tears it apart, metaphorically speaking. And sometimes, literally, he tears things apart in the sense that he'll look at it and he'll look at all of its tiny details. And you will have done exactly the same. But as you get older, you start to look at the world through, through some certain lenses that you've, that you've put in front of your eyes as a result of, of your training at school. There's nothing wrong with that. Your teachers are trying to make you stronger, but they're preparing you for exams. And sometimes preparing to write the best essays in, it, it entails a little bit of regression, a little bit of sort of going back to that sort of curious toddler stage and imagining you're in a sandbox and just exploring the world around you. So what do I mean concretely by this? Well, let's take the question, uh, is knowledge dangerous? Now, if I was to even try and ask that to my son, Teddy, is knowledge dangerous? Well, he would have so many follow-up questions before he could even try and answer this he would sort of say well, what is knowledge and what is dangerous and what is is you know he would absolutely rip this question apart and that's exactly what you should do and he would also be really sort of he fastidious you want to know what all of the elements of the question mean and this is another great skill of toddlers is they're actually highly disciplined ironically they don't drift off the point they sort of say but what does that mean they're, they're, they're dogged and determined and that's what you should be 
are humans ruining the earth? What, what's the earth? What does it mean to ruin something? What are, what are humans, right? You need to go through the question with a fine tooth comb, and that's what toddlers would do, okay? Do humans need religion? What does it mean to need something? What is a religion? Are we talking about Judeo-Christian religions? Are we talking about monotheistic religions? Or are we talking about those religions which don't have gods and are more philosophical, like Buddhism? What does it mean to need something? Do I mean need in the sense of it's going to sustain me, it's going to keep me alive, or do I need it to, to help me form some facet of my personality? Okay, now of course the toddler wouldn't necessarily come up with that sort of analysis, but they would at least ask the right questions. What does it mean to need? What is, it, what is religion? That's what I mean by thinking like a toddler. It'll, it'll mean that you analyze the question with a degree of detail that it deserves because you're not going to take any details for granted whatsoever okay so do that think like a toddler it's quite fun as well actually and um, the next thing is that you need to provide a logical structure to your your essay Pro perhaps the most common way that people write essays is just off the top of their heads so it'll be a little bit like if they're having a conversation with someone and as ideas pop into their mind they start writing them down the problem with that is that we don't have access to your mind so we can't as readers fully understand why you've decided to go from point A to point Y to point F. You know, it seems like you're hopping around seemingly at random. What you want to try and obtain is, is a structure that goes from point A to point B to point C. So it's clear and it makes sense. So logical in the sense simply means that it's easy to follow and it makes sense for somebody else, okay? So we could take a, an argument that might even have completely nonsensical points, but is nonetheless completely logical in its structure, such as what I've put up here. My dog plays chess. Chess players eat biscuits, therefore my dog eats biscuits. Now, the conclusion is correct, but both of the premises, both of the points that lead to that conclusion are silly and don't make any sense. But it, nonetheless, this is a logically structured argument. Can you see that by going through the points, my dog plays chess, chess players eat biscuits, you inevitably have to reach the conclusion that my dog eats biscuits. You, you almost don't even need to say it. It it's just follows on so logically from the points that we've made. And that's the way you want to try and work out writing your essay. An essay is a bit like a bad joke, that the punchline is absolutely obvious to everyone before they've even read it. The punchline being your ultimate point, your ultimate argument you're trying to say. Yes, knowledge is dangerous. No, it isn't yes, we need religion, whatever it is, you go through in a certain way that it, that conclusion becomes practically unavoidable, okay? Now, how can you break down your essay into points, into sort of segmented chunks that you can go through in some sort of sequence of A, B, C? Well, what I suggest is that you seek out what I call the hook word in the question. Now, the hook word is that word, or sometimes words, upon which you have to hook your argument. It's the central contention that you're dealing with. Now, remember I mentioned that you could imagine you're a lawyer in court and you're trying to defend your client who's been accused of a crime. In that court trial, the hook word, the word that you are gonna be fighting with against your opposition is guilt or guilty. That's the thing that you're gonna be fighting over. Is my client guilty or not guilty? That word is everything to your argument. Everything you present to the judge and the jury has to come back to that central contention about guilty, okay? And essay questions have a similar focus and you just need to work out where is that focal point. So let's start with the question, are humans ruining the earth? If you imagine this becomes something that would be tried in a court in front of a judge, the, the both sides of the debate, the argument, would have to convince the other people in the courtroom that yes humans are ruining the earth or no humans are not ruining the earth so ruining is the hook word it is the word that everyone's argument is going to focus on and come back to it is the guilty of this particular debate and so you need to hang your argument off it if you can split the notion of ruining into particular chunks you can work through them in a logical progression okay is knowledge dangerous Yes, it is dangerous. No, it is not dangerous. Or it is dangerous, but only to a certain extent. The word dangerous is the hook word of that question, and you can use it to segment your argument in a nice, clean, logical progression. 
Do humans need religion? Yes, they do need religion. No, they don't need religion. They do need religion, but only to a certain extent. Those are the three arguments you can come up with, and therefore need is the focus of that particular question. What does it mean to need something is the way that you construct your case. Let me show you in more fine-grained detail what I'm talking about. This could be a structure to an essay. And if you plan your essay before you write it, it'll be much clearer and much easier to read. And the way to plan it is to start by identifying that hook word in the question. So in regards to whether or not humans are ruining the earth, we would start with an introductory paragraph that answers the question and outlines the way your argument is structured. You might then want to define what you think it means to ruin something. And then we use that definition and split it into three or so bits that we can move through in a logical sequence of A, B, C. So we've got ruining part one, that it means to undermine all that we value about the earth, then ruining part two, specifically making the earth less habitable for human beings, and then ruining part three, making the earth less habitable for plants and other animals. Then we might have a, a paragraph with some counter arguments to stress test our claims, and then a conclusion. That would be a nice logical structure. If a stranger was reading my essay about whether or not humans were, re were ruining the earth, they would understand why I've moved through the points in that order. I've not just sort of allowed ideas to pop up in my mind and for me to commit them to paper. I've come up with something that's much easier to understand and to follow. Okay, so that's how you can ensure that your essays are clearly written and are logically structured. You focus on that hook word in the question. What is the central contention here? What is it that we're fighting over? Once you've identified that, you can break it up into its little bits. And to work out how to break it up into its little bits, get your toddler to tear it apart. Get your inner toddler to sort of say, well, what is ruining me? Oh, it could be this, it could be that. And that's where you can start to be creative and, and um, come up with some interesting ideas. Okay, so um, that's uh, broadly speaking how you can come up with a logical structure. Next up, balance. Now, we are always on the lookout for nicely balanced essays. Now, what that doesn't mean is that we want you to sit on the fence. In other words, we don't want you, when you're being asked a direct question, to sort of say, I don't know, or to say, well, it could be this or it could be that. Because that degree of balance is totally unhelpful. You're not trying to answer the question there. So it's not, strictly speaking, an essay in the literal sense of an attempt to solve the problem. So excessive balance is no good because it doesn't solve the problem at hand. So if, for example, we were asked the questions, are humans ruining the earth? And you said, I don't know, or they could be, or they might not be, that's useless. You're not answering the question. So that's even worse than a politician trying to duck the question because you're not even providing anything close to an answer. So avoid that degree of balance. What I do mean by a nice balanced essay is where you acknowledge what your critics would think. And you explain why, respectfully, you don't agree with them. So if, for example, you were tempted to argue, no, humans are not ruining the earth, and you come up with a nice segmentation of what it means to ruin the earth, and you just say, they're really not doing, humans are not ruining the earth in this way, that way, or the other way, and therefore the conclusion must be that humans are not ruining the earth, just empathize with your opponents. What would they say? What would critics of you say? They would probably say, well, have you thought about what humans are doing with regards to biodiversity, or what about what humans are doing with regards to climate change? But you can then explain why you think respectfully they're not quite right and why, despite their claims, humans are still not ruining the earth. Can you see how that would make your argument much stronger? Because it shows you're conscious, you're aware of what other people would say, and you're able to defend your case against their criticisms. Again, going back to the lawyers in court, the best lawyers are not the ones that just argue their case, but also anticipate what their critics and their opponents would say in order to crush their arguments as well. So the best lawyer will not only say, my client is not guilty, but the prosecution's case is completely messed up on these grounds and they'll tear it apart. Okay, that's what makes for a really powerful argument. And it's balanced, but not weak and not sitting on the fence. Okay, hopefully that makes sense. But as ever, you know, do submit any questions you might have. I don't think we've got any just yet, but uh, if you do have any questions or comments, for goodness sake, do feel free to, to contribute. Okay, uh, so what's next? Is it original? Right, the best essays are the ones that are original, meaning that you, the author, are contributing some original insights to the debate. 
So you're not just repeating something that somebody else has written uh, or said, you're coming up with your own ideas. Now being utterly original is very difficult, if not almost impossible in, uh, in essay writing, because most things have been said by someone at some point. But it's nonetheless possible to say, to speak for yourself and to come up with some ideas that are truly fresh. And you should aspire to that. You should aspire to speak for yourself because it's relatively easy to just repeat what somebody else has said. It's far more difficult and therefore more skillful to say something that's new. And you shouldn't be too worried about getting it wrong because most of these questions don't have a right answer. So having the guts to go there and just say, I think this is a plausible solution. And here, let me tell you why I think it's plausible. That can be really, really powerful. And the best paid, the best rewarded members of the labor market are those that are capable of coming up with the most innovative solutions to these intractable problems. And that's particularly what we train Oxford students to be capable of. Uh, so don't just repeat what others are saying, try and speak for yourself. And be confident, you know, be proud of yourself. Provided you're saying things that you think are plausible and logical, then the onus is on your readers to explain why they disagree with you, okay? There are some specific ways you can be more creative and you can develop your thinking skills. One of which is to pay closer attention to detail than most people do. And that's where your inner toddler comes in. If you take a concept like ruining, and you look at it in a really interesting way, and you perhaps consider a different form of ruining than other people look at, then that's a way to be creative and original. Remember I mentioned the young lady last year who wrote a fantastic essay about how footballers uh, were not in fact paid more than nurses. She achieved that by looking at, the, looking at what a footballer was in greater detail than most people did. So she didn't take any detail for granted, she looked at it really carefully, and that's how she extracted a, a truly original insight. So that's one way to be creative. Unleash your inner toddler, because chances are that the inner child will think about things in a much less sort of uh, systematic and organized way and will come up with some more original thoughts. Another way to be more creative is to be quite contrary, to think against received wisdom. This is not in the sense of just saying, oh, everyone else is wrong, but to be a constructive critic, to sort of say, well, everyone tends to think this, but I'm inclined to think the other. So, for example, in answer to the question, are humans ruining the earth? Maybe a contrary view to what many people would think is that, no, humans are absolutely not ruining the earth. And one way we could try and reach that conclusion is to sort of say, well, what does the earth want? How can you ruin the earth? Perhaps humans, by uh, accelerating climate change, are actually advancing the Earth's agenda, you can say such a thing if that makes any sense, because the, the forces that created life on Earth come from the laws of thermodynamics. And those laws seek out entropy. In other words, one of the reasons that we are alive is because we are very good at generating wasteful energy and, and sort of moving energy down a gradient. And so you could say that the Earth we're not ruining the earth, we're doing exactly what the earth and the universe wants us to do by, by propagating climate change. Now it's a slightly bonkers uh, argument, but you know, why not go there? <laughs> so if you see where received wisdom tends to go and you think, well, what, what about the alternatives? Maybe you could explore those to come up with something a little bit different, a little bit more original. Okay, um, next up, uh, how do you finish? How do you finish an essay? Well. There's a famous uh, way of saying how to write an essay. First of all, you say what you're going to say in the introduction, then you say it, and then you say what you've said. And that's pretty much what a conclusion should do. So it seems quite repetitive, but bear in mind you're trying to convince your readers that you've got this solution to a problem. So being repetitive is just a good way of making sure that they are on message, that they are going to finish up reading your essay agreeing with you. Again, going back to the, the lawyers in court, if you constantly remind the judge and the jury that your client is innocent, then chances are they will just keep remembering that point. So being repetitive in a conclusion is not a bad thing in the slightest. One thing that you can add in a conclusion is you can draw out some of the implications of what you've said. In other words, let's say your conclusion is that humans are ruining the earth, then an implication of that might be, well, maybe we should have some uh, tax on uh, polluting 
uh, activities because that might stop humans ruining the earth so much. So in other words, you're sort of saying, well, given I've concluded that we are ruining the earth, what, what next? What should we do about that? So that would be an implication. And that could be something you could fruitfully pull out in your um, conclusion. Uh, sorry, I've got a question, I think. Um, Oh, so um, uh, Keris asks a great question. How would you alter this way of essay writing to better suit an essay that asks how, rather than having a simple yes or no answer? We get told not to list in any way throughout the, throughout. So how could we create an introduction that answers the question? Yeah, that's a great question, Keris. So, um, so if, for example, the question was how are humans ruining the earth rather than are humans ruining the earth, how could you come up with a good answer to that question? Again, you need to make sure that your introduction is clearly focused on the question. So in your opening lines, you would have to describe in very straightforward terms how humans are ruining the earth in a single sentence. Humans are ruining the earth by blah, and then explain what you think the mechanism is by which humans are ruining the earth. Um, and then the hook word becomes how and ruining, because that's how, that's what you would focus on if you were having a court trial about how are humans ruining the earth. So then your essay structure needs to focus on how humans are ruining the earth. The way to avoid a list of points, a shopping list, is to show how those points come together into a coherent case. Now, what I mean by that is that you want to avoid writing a shopping list and instead you want to provide a recipe. So if, for example, I was to tell you to go and make some biscuits and I just gave you a shopping list, you wouldn't know how to make biscuits. If I gave you the instructions as to how you can take those ingredients and pull them together and make biscuits, then you'd understand. And that's how, that's how to avoid just a, a list of points where you just say, well, this could be how, and this could be how, and this could be how. You need to show how they come together in a single case. So when you've come up with your list of things that you think explain how humans are ruining the earth, work out what those things all have in common. What's the underlying factor that they all branch off from? And then that can be your major point that begins and ends your essay. And that's a way of avoiding it being just a shopping list and becoming a recipe. I hope that makes sense, Keris, but that's a great question and, and a difficult one to answer. Okay, so moving on from conclusions, I've got some examples of answers, opening uh, paragraphs, introductions to the same essay question. Uh, and I want you to see which you think are the best, okay? And this will hopefully crystallize some of the points I've been making over the last 45 minutes or so. Now I've written these so I've not sort of taken them from poor students uh, that I'm trying to embarrass in public. Um, I've written them using the sort of approaches to essay writing that students commonly apply to give you an idea of what's good practice and what's maybe less good. Okay so the question that I've selected is can war be a good thing which is also on the Oxplor website. Can war be a good thing? And I've written four plausible introductory paragraphs to this. And I want you to basically feel like you're the examiner now. So you're the one that's trying to work out what's good, what's not so good, and what's the best. Okay. So let's start with A. Uh, Dolce et decorum est pro patria mori. Gore-soaked soldiers, recumbent in a faraway field, may ponder the vaulting rationale and baser ambitions that brought them pain. The searing physicality of war combined with its existential threat compel us to question its purposes. Now, <laughs> um, the reason I wrote that is because it's quite common in essays for students to try and use very flowery and sophisticated, even poetic language. And I'm often, often asked, is it necessary? And the straight answer is no, it's not. You don't need to sound like someone else. You don't need to pre pre pretend to be someone with a, a vast vocabulary and you don't need to bust out your thesaurus to try and come up with some really flowery uh, sentences. Because apart from anything else, uh, the, uh, the paragraph in A is very difficult to understand. It might make sense after reading it four or five times, but it's just, it's bulky and it's difficult to comprehend. And the ultimate point of an essay is to share your ideas with readers. And so writing something that's very obtuse and very difficult to read is going to make that much harder. So don't feel the need nor the temptation to use highly sophisticated and flowery language because 
it, it is in all likelihood going to make it more difficult for you to be understood. That's not to say that you can't apply some elegant language and you can use some, some poetic metaphorical word, words and phrases, but don't go over the top and don't sort of try and pretend to be someone you're not. Another thing you might notice is whether or not you need to start with a quote. The danger with starting with a quote is that you are allowing someone from the very get-go to speak on your behalf. And don't forget at all times that the essay is you and your contribution to the debate. And if you allow someone else to talk on your behalf, then you are, uh, you're, um, you're denying yourself the ability to, to, to speak. There's no harm in starting with a quote, but only if you then take charge of the essay yourself. So if you very clearly move from the quote to your argument, then that would be fine. And do you need to quote in Latin? Oh, good God, no. It's so pretentious <laughs> and so unnecessary. Um, sorry, I've got a, got a comment. Um, how many words should an essay generally be? Um, good question, Beth. So you'll usually be told uh, how many words you are allowed in an essay. Um, the essays for Oxford University students are typically 2,000 words. Um, the essays that we're doing for this essay competition are about 800 words, I think, but the instructions are, are online. Um, I think a good essay is usually pretty short, actually. You don't need to write an awful lot to come up with a convincing case. So that's another key point, which is that sometimes less is more when it comes to essay writing, but it's a good question, Beth. Anyway, that was A, and the point of writing A was that it was just over the top, pretentious, too complicated, not necessary, okay? You don't need to pretend to be someone you're else. Using your own voice is completely fine. Uh, B, war can certainly be a good thing, but is typically not. The goodness of war depends on why it's fought and how it's fought. In particular, defense of the vulnerable against tyranny is a good thing, but only when pursued with proportionate force. Further, I argue war is not simply a good thing, but in fact, a good method as violence to prevent worse violence. Okay, now B is much better as an introduction. First of all, the opening line directly answers the question. So the question was, can war be a good thing? And in the opening line of B, the uh, author has just got, taken the, the question by the, by the scruff of the neck and said, well, directly, it can certainly be a good thing, but it's typically not. So it's answering the question, but with quite a sophisticated response. It's not saying black or white, yes or no, but it's coming up with this sort of shades of gray approach. And then it ex explains precisely on what those shades of gray come from. The goodness of war depends on why it's fought and how it's fought, okay? Now, there are some problems with this introduction. First of all, the goodness of war depends on why it's fought. Now that should be it apostrophe s fought, why it is fought. And actually, ideally, it should be it is. Avoid using apostrophes because that sort of shortened language looks a bit too casual. And this raises the question as to whether or not grammatical mistakes like this are a bad thing and could, could uh, lead to you getting lower marks. And the simple answer is yes, it will. I don't necessarily believe that we should be quite so fastidious about spelling, punctuation, and grammar, but that is the world we live in. And it does tend to be interpreted as sloppy writing if you have some typos like this. So just be very, very careful when you're proofreading. It's worth noting that we at Oxford are acutely aware that your ability to process language is not a particularly good way of measuring someone's intelligence. Uh, for example, 85% of our maths undergraduates have some form of dyslexia, 85%. So there are lots of people that struggle with reading, writing and grammar. But nonetheless, if you have the capacity to check your grammar, if, for example, you've got some software that can help you out or you've got the time to be careful and fastidious, then you should do it because it is expected. So B isn't perfect. Another thing about B to note is that it uses the first person. In other words, I argue. So should you do that? Should you write I, me, my in your essays? Very common question. The short answer is that at university, we don't mind. At school, teachers tend to say, don't do it. Just avoid using, avoid referring to yourself. And if that's the way you've been taught, it's probably the safest way to go. When it comes to university, we're not quite so bothered. The thing is not so much whether or not you refer to yourself, but what you refer to yourself doing. So what's the verb you're using? It's fine to say, I argue something. It's much weaker to say, I believe something, okay? 
let me explain why. Um, again, imagine you're a lawyer in court and you've got to try and defend your client who's been accused of a crime. If you go up to the jury and you say, I believe my client is innocent, that sounds really weak, doesn't it? Because they, why should they believe the way you believe? Belief is far too personal, far too subjective. It's much better to say, I argue, I submit, I have reason to suggest that my client is innocent. That's more convincing. But if you start saying, I believe it's my opinion that my client is innocent, oh no, it's so weak. So don't worry so much about the pronoun you're using, I, me, my, worry more about the verb that you attach to that. I argue, I contend, I have reason to believe, I have reason to believe, fine, but simply I believe, no good, not convincing at all, okay? So that's another thing I wanted to raise there. Okay, I've got two more just to show off some other sort of common traits in essay writing style. So C, can war be a good thing? C says, war comes in all sorts of forms. Besides battles between soldiers, sailors and aircrew, there are, especially in modern times, wars conducted using computer viruses, financial instruments, secret intelligence, data sabotage, biointerference and even intellectual property theft. War is nothing new, albeit its potential carnage is far worse than ever in the nuclear age. So is it a good thing? Okay. Now, the good thing about C is that the author has been a bit of a toddler with the question. So he or she has really torn apart what it means for, for us to talk about war. They're not just taking it in a straightforward way. They're sort of saying, well, what is war? And they're coming up with lots of interesting ways to pull the notion of war around the place. So that's really good and interesting. The massive problem with C is that they just haven't answered the question. So at the end of this introductory paragraph, I'm no wiser as to what they're trying to argue than I was at the start. So as the reader, as far as I'm concerned, the essay hasn't even started yet because I just simply don't know what they're trying to argue. So it's always best to make sure that in your opening paragraph, you answer the question. And ideally you do so in the first line. So remember B, B does that, B answers the question in the opening line. It's a sophisticated answer, but it's nonetheless clear and it uses the essay question in order to frame the response. So that is best practice here. With C, I've read the introduction, I still don't know what they're arguing. That would be a bit like the lawyer in court having some sort of waffly introductory uh, gambit, at the end of which the jury have no clue whether or not they think the client is innocent or guilty. It's just not very helpful. So for the, for the ease of your audience's understanding, start with a very clear response to the question. Okay, what about D? It can be argued that war is natural and therefore must be good. It has also been argued, in fact, they don't, it doesn't write, it has also been, but never mind. It has also argued by many that wars rarely achieve anything of much help to anyone, so they aren't really good. I believe we should look at all of these different arguments one by one. Okay, again, the problem with D is there's no answer. And in this case, D is quite obviously sitting on the fence. D is saying, well, we need to look at this and we need to look at that. Well, yes, but ultimately you need to solve the problem. That's the point of an essay. Don't just, don't just present all of the di different arguments. You're not a curator of a museum of curiosities. You're a, you're a debater, you're a fighter. You need to come up with an answer. Okay, and that's the, the key problem with, with D. Uh, sorry, Aisha asks, what are some sentence starters you recommended for a stronger argument? Um, so the, the strongest arguments are clear, directly respond to the question, uh, and demonstrate you have thought about the problem in some depth and detail. So the reason that I think B is a good starting point for an essay is because it's clear, it's direct, and it shows a degree of um, thought, that it's not just black and white, it's not saying yes, war is a good thing, it's, showing, it's saying that war can be a good thing under specific circumstances and it describes those circumstances so i think that makes for a strong starter the weaker starters are a because it's too flowery and it's difficult to understand other weak starts would be c because although it, it tears apart the idea of war very nicely it doesn't answer the question and d also doesn't answer the question uh, and just sort of sits massively on the fence another problem with d is that it's committed what's called the naturalistic fallacy now what that is is where it says it can be argued that war is natural and therefore must be good this is called the naturalistic fallacy 
it, because it implies that something being natural is morally good. Uh, and it, it, it's, it, it being natural is what makes it good. The problem is that morality and nature don't necessarily coincide. And there's lots of things that are natural that we may think are utterly immoral. You know, there's some ghastly things that animals do to each other um, that we would probably not describe as moral, but would certainly describe as natural. It's quite a common argument that people sort of say, oh, well, that must be right because it's the way nature intended it. But actually sometimes, you know, the way nature intends things is horrifying. So, <laughs> you know, you need to be very careful with the naturalistic fallacy. You know, I'm wearing clothes and speaking to you through a computer. I don't think any of those things are strictly speaking natural, um, but I wouldn't describe them as bad either. So be careful with the naturalistic fallacy. How are we able to formulate our own questions for an essay, asks Morgan. Um, good question. In fact, I'm going to come to that next. So thank you, Morgan. You've helped me segue to my next point, which is what now? Um, the way to formulate your own questions is to find some intractable doubt in your life or in the world around you that you'd really like to solve. And this, again, is a way uh, of regressing back to a toddler to thinking like that curious inner child and sort of seeing the world around you and thinking, well, why on earth does that happen and what is going on here? And just framing some sort of puzzle that you'd really like to solve. So, you know, the, the sky's the limit. You can come up with almost anything. Um, some puzzles I came up with the other day were, uh, why do we have nightmares? Which I thought was pretty interesting. Uh, and connected to that, you could ask, why do we dream? Um, I also thought about, well, does my mobile phone get heavier when I download apps onto it? That's an interesting question. Um, what else do I ask? Uh, why are humans the only species that cry uh, emotional tears? Is another question. Um, quite a lot of sort of physiological questions I've come up with. Uh, you know, you ask whatever matters to you. That's how to frame a question. So take something that, like, that your inner toddler has never received a satisfactory answer to, that you've thought, what on earth is going on here? And if you, if you become the curious toddler again and you look at the world around you, you'll start to notice that there is mystery and doubt everywhere, that there's so much that is just weird and seemingly inexplicable. And if you frame it as a question, you can start to structure a response to it. You can start to work out an answer to it. So that would be how I would frame your own questions. And I think that actually can make it a really enjoyable process because it can help you sort of work out more about the world around you and take some care and interest in what's going on. So that would be my advice, but uh, it's a great question, Morgan. So um, that's, that's the end of the session. Uh, we've had a full hour. Thank you so much for listening. Um, if anyone has any further questions, do feel free to submit them uh, either in the chat bar or to just unmute yourself and, and say them out loud. Uh, we'll be sharing this, um, this recording on uh, YouTube. We'll put it up onto YouTube and we'll share it via Twitter. So do feel free to watch it back if you wish. And feel free to contact me uh, by email. My email address is at the bottom of the screen there if you have any follow-up questions. But uh, you know, thank you for your commitment. You've shown yourselves to be going above and beyond by listening to me waffle on for an hour. Uh, hopefully I'll get to meet you one day when all of this horrible lockdown business has ended. Um, oh, what's the name of our YouTube channel? It's just Jesus College Oxford, um, but we'll be sharing it on Twitter and you should receive uh, updates via uh, Seren and all the rest of it. But uh, that's all from me. So thank you all very much. Have a, have a lovely day. Stay safe. Look after yourselves and your families. And, uh, and yeah, hopefully once this is all over, we'll, uh, we'll get to meet properly. But uh, all the best, everyone. Bye now. Cheers.